I gives me unbelievably great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Jens Monig. Jens, as you all know, is the author of Snap. He's a researcher at SAP. He is a renaissance man. He's a musician. He's creative. If, this, if you ever can't believe that programming is creative, you need to watch what Jens is going to do. And it gives me great, great pleasure to introduce Jens, who's today going to talk about Hyperblocks, the great new feature that he's going to show you all in Snap 6. Welcome, Jens. Let's give him a hand. Jens, woo! I will stop sharing and give, yield the floor to my friend. It's all you, my friend. Thank you, Dan. Uh, uh, thanks to everybody for coming. Wow, this is, this is crazy. I've got my screen. I've got several screens full of friends, of people I know, and, I, and some I don't know. And I have to confess um, that I've been up very late last night because I'm so excited about this. I'm actually going to share my screen. Um, okay, I have to, no, wait, I have to remember to um, also share my computer sound. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. And um, okay, here I'm in Snap. I did prepare um, a couple of slides. I'm not sure I might, I might actually not do them. So um, this talk is about the new version of Snap, um, which is somehow a point of completion we feel of Kind of the last year. We were kind of caught off guard last summer by Chrome becoming unstable, and we really needed to rewrite large parts of Snap to make it stable again and to make it scale. And this is kind of what we're trying in this new version 6 release to grow Snap, to make it handle bigger projects, to make it go run faster, and to make it do kind of more things that have a sense of reality. Um, so, so this is something that we feel is a, a, a motivation. We want to prepare students for the real world. And, and what does it even mean? So last night, as I was kind of um, procrastinating, um, I had a look into my old um, ancient Webster dictionary. And there's lots of stuff um, on here that's very philosophical, very ontological. And um, actually, when I read down to the fourth meaning, it all made sense. Uh, real, you'd pronounce it real, and it was once the chief former monetary unit of Spain. Um, so here's a real. Um, so it's, it's money. It's, it's, it's something you can get paid by. Um, and um, this is actually funny. Um, so, so, so this one I got is, is not real, it's fake. Um, but boy, if it were real, um, I'd be able to trade it in for like uh, 10 hamburgers. Um, in this um, restaurant in, in, in Minnesota. Um, and lots of things kind of make sense when you think of real as something that you can touch, but you can also make money with. For example, many things about programming, um, like how can I use my old computer to make money? Or um, like even if I'm this um, Ebenezer Scrooge impersonating Abe Lincoln cosplayer. There's real world functional programming in the pipeline for me. And um, very often kind of this other dimension of realness is kind of this, this physical world where something can be touched. And there's all, you know, here's a company from Malaysia that has got this all covered. This is their collection of robots. It's actually an ascension. It starts with pre-K with a small robot. And it goes up to middle school. There's four levels, no, two levels of university level robots. And I uh, kind of get the impression that as the bots grow, uh, a growth mindset is somehow transferred to the students. So we prepare them for their hands on jobs later. Um, except that many of the things we've already experienced in the real world aren't really so hands on. Like even physical things like you know, the Super Bowl, like sports events, we often get them second-handed, um, so by watching TV. Um, many of the things that affect us very directly, like politics we get from reading the news or uh, online or an actual printed newspaper. And I sure stayed up very late to watch the live video stream um, of the Falcon 9 uh, flying out to the ISS. All of this, I wasn't there in reality, but I was reaching this through media. And, you know, lastly, we're all here in this online conference because um, 
things happen in reality that we can't see, that we can't go out and kick, but they still affect us. And it needs science to explain this to us. So all of this is basically media. Media kind of connects us to what's happening. And this is something that I fell in love with a while ago. Um, it's really kind of the pedagogy that Mark Gusdahl and Barb Erickson kind of invented to teach general purpose programming by looking at media, because that's just so very relevant. Um, so this is kind of an approach that we followed for the last two years. And the way hyperblocks happened is through a mistake that we often saw. So actually kind of right before uh, this COVID crisis, when we were, Jadka and I were in Erlangen, hi, people from Erlangen, um, talking to some teachers and we often kind of start by saying, you know, in Snap, um, you've got the plus block, you can get fear, uh, uh, three plus four, you get seven. And um, what if you have a list? And um, so say we've got a list of um, a bunch of numbers. And um, so what if we want to um, apply the three plus blank block to every item of the list? And we ask them, and usually um, somebody comes up with the idea of, uh, of taking because programming is all about. And then we, usually, we ask, you know, do you know any other way? And you know, we kind of press them hard and sometimes somebody knows and usually we just end up showing them the snap way, which is we use map, um, no loop, we use map and uh, we just do it in a single statement. But in Erlangen, as every other time, um, sometimes there is somebody who carefully asks, uh, can we do this? Um, and we say, ah, no, not really. You see, because of plus, uh, the domain of plus is numbers. Um, and so here's a number and a list. And if we click on this, it's, yeah, we don't know what to do with this. It's, it's a mistake. It's not a number. And the more these things came up, the more I remembered that actually 10 years ago, uh, Brian and I uh, sat in Brian's basement and were leafing through some old APL manuals because Brian told me the story how when he was 14, Ken Iverson was one of his mentors and he fell in love with APL and APL was able to do just that. So this is kind of the big new feature aside from making things faster that in the new version of SNAP, now we have hyperblocks and I just turned it off for this demo. So I'm turning it on as it is for all of you. And with hyperblocks, now this makes sense. And notice that where heretofore you used to get an error or something that you probably didn't want, we're trying to make sense of something that is almost naive. So we can add a number to a list. We can also have two lists. Let's see, this is um, forty, and so now we have a dyadic function, and we're trying to um, find items that correspond. So here, four items correspond. So we um, add the first item of the left list to the first item of the second list, and so on. So we basically expanded the domain of monadic and dyadic functions from scalars to lists and tables to vectors and matrices and multidimensional data. Um, so this also works with um, many other functions, many other reporters. Um, like um, here's the numbers from one to 10 block. And so these are also numbers. What if we put another list of numbers in here and we click on it, um, wow, we get a table. Um, what if we put it here, we get another interesting table. And also another feature is as we can right click on anything to get a blockified version of that table of that list. And we can see kind of that the blocks in here resemble the result. It also works with things on strings. For example, there's a Unicode of a block that gives us a number. If instead of just a letter, we write in a story like the quick brown fox 
jumps over the lazy dog. Um, so instead of and as a list, we can apply an arithmetic function to it, um, the times block or the plus block, and you know just um, add three, for example, to every number. Now we get another list of numbers. This also works for the inverse function. Here is Unicode uh, of a number as a letter. We get a letter. Now if we pass in a list of numbers, we get a list of letters. So once we have a list of letters, um, well, we can just concatenate them using join. And we got another word, an encrypted word. And this is basically like a Caesar cipher. So we could turn this into our own block and say, um, encrypt a text um, with a key. Um, and this is a reporter and text is gonna be an input and key is gonna be an input. And we just put this in here and key is gonna come first and text is gonna come second. So this is our encrypt block. So now I can give it a call. It's called secret. I'm gonna set the secret to you know, encrypt um, my story with, uh, let's say five, um, the key five. So now here's my secret and Kind of the beauty of this kind of way of thinking is we can use the same function to decrypt it again. So here's my secret. And if I know the key, I can just negate it. So this was um, not four, it was five. If I say minus five, I again get the original text. Now, mind you, this is almost naively simple. If you look at this code, Often kind of you do a Caesar cipher to introduce loops, to introduce variables, to introduce state and kind of encoding. But really the algorithm isn't all that spectacular. It's not here and it can be formulated in almost a naive way. Um, so this is almost kind of the essence. Now let's apply to something more fun. Since this is the first scratch conference in the US, Let's actually start with um, America first. Um, the Star Spangled Banner. Um, let's see if, um, okay, so now I've got this sound. I'm gonna play the Star Spangled Banner. <laughs> uh, patriotic thing, I got the sound. Uh, and I can find out things about the sound. This is a kind of media computation. I can find out it lasts for 77 seconds. And I can also check the samples. So if I click on the samples, I get the numbers. And it's a list of 3.4 million numbers in between minus one and plus one. And this is kind of one of the design principles that numbers and lists of numbers are really just one block away from all of media. So if this is a list, we can just use our math blocks on them. For example, we could just say, okay, what if I multiply three with the samples? I get another list and the numbers are slightly larger. So we're gonna play that back. You might wanna tune down your sound a little bit. Um, <laughs> It's loud because we multiply it with more energy. Likewise, we can divide it by something. Let's actually divide it by four and listen to it. So this is the idea, it's just, simple arithmetic, we can do things directly on data to find out interesting things. So here's another block in here. This is, for example, the greater than block. So what happens if I put the samples in here and I ask like if the samples are greater than zero? Now this is a hexagonal diamond shape block, it's a predicate. 
And if I click this, I usually get true or false. But here I'm entering a list of numbers. Um, so the result is a 3.4 million item list with falses and some trues in it, false, true and false in it. Um, so I've basically gotten rid of all the nuances and just reduced it to, well, is it one or zero? Um, it's, it's basically an on and off, a one bit encoding. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, tune down your volume. Here's George Boole and the Binary Brass Band's rendition of the Star Spangled Banner. Okay, turns out George Bull is Jimi Hendrix's younger brother. Um, he kind of needs to play with his guitar some more. So simple arithmetic, um, we can do things with numbers because numbers are at the heart of media. That's kind of the idea. And this is where hyperblocks really help us get rid of all the loops of all the state of all the variables. Let's actually try to make sense of some data. I'm gonna import something else, something real from my computer. Um, I'm gonna go into my music, The Wall, another thing that plays a big role nowadays. There is a song, it's Empty Spaces. I'm showing this in Finder. Here's the song. I'm gonna drag this into Snap. Now it's in Snap. I'm just gonna try whether I can play it. Empty Spaces from Pink Floyd. Not much of a song. Goes on like this for a while. In other words, okay. So we can also look at the samples. I'm gonna look at the samples of Empty Spaces from Pink Floyd. And here you see something interesting. It's not a list, it's a table. So a table, um, because it's a stereo song, so it has two lists. It has a left channel and a right channel. Um, so right channel, that's the item two of the samples. Now I'm getting this, this list. Um, I'm just gonna look at this list. So how do I access items in a list? I use the item off block. So if I get the item one of a list, I'm getting a number. If I kind of type in any number that's within the range, uh, that was outside of the range, <laughs> I'm getting another number. I can also, since this is hyperblocks, put in a list of numbers. So I can get the second one, um, get some numbers. And I'm copying those numbers out of the list of all the samples. And if they're consecutive, I can use the numbers from two block. So for example, I can get the numbers of 600,000 to 700,000. I'm getting a list of, um, you can play this. Um, where it gets interesting is when you look at a certain part of the song that I've been chasing last night, and it's, it's 3.150, 1112, 3.830. Um, this is a bunch of samples that is interesting. Um, let's actually play this part of the song. There's some music happening here. Okay, that's not the really interesting part. Because what's interesting is happening in the other channel. It's happening in the left channel. So let's look at the other channel and listen closely or hear something. So we're going to find out what they're actually saying, these voices. So we're making a variable, making, clipping this, and I want to look at this part of the song. So I'm setting 
the clipping to this part of the a list of numbers. So now clipping is the part I want to look at. And I want to, you guessed it, play this backwards because I'm thinking that maybe YouTube and Google showed me that this is the secret behind the song and I want to find that out. Um, so if I get the numbers from one to 10, I get an ascending list of numbers. If I get 10 to one, I get a descending list of numbers. So one trick I can do is I can get the length of the clipping that I made, um, and I count down to one. So now I get a very long list that counts down all the way to one. And I can use this as a selector. So I'm getting the item, counting all the way down, Now, listen closely to what we're hearing now. Congratulations. I've just discovered the secret message. Please send your answer to old pink. Congratulations. You have just discovered the secret message. Please mail your answer to old pink and then there's some other voices um so we've just made sense out of some data we've we've uh, gone down to the numbers we've manipulated the numbers um and we've kind of played it backwards and the music actually didn't sound so bad and all of this we've also found out how to reverse the list so we can actually generalize this and say we're going to make a new reporter that is going to say reverse list and I'm just going to do this and instead of the clipping um oops and instead of the clipping um we're going to turn list into an input and use this here so this is the code that reverses it let's try it again once more This is all the code we need. That was wrong, of course. This is the problem with doing this online. It's, it's counting up instead of down. Um, so got into the wrong slot. Let's try it again. And so on. So this is something um, that is interesting. And look at the code. It didn't take us a lot of code. And most of it really is almost trivial, almost naive to think of. So none of the, let's do a loop, none of the assignment problems, none of the state problems. It's an almost naive way of thinking about these things. Um, so this was how we can use hyperblocks on lists. Let's actually try something else. Um, I'm going to hide this. I'm going to make a costume, taking my webcam and making a picture of myself and making another one of myself. Okay, now I've got two pictures. They're called camera and camera two. Um, and um, I can go and look at the costumes and find out things about camera. But the most important things I can find out about the camera costume is the pixels. So if I click on the pixels, I'm getting a table. It's a table with uh, 172,000 rows and the uh, columns are the color channels. Um, uh, uh, red, green, blue, and the alpha channel. And I can get the same thing of the camera two picture. Um, so it's also a table. And remember when we told you that we could use these operators, these functions, dyadic functions on scalars, uh, vectors, and matrices. So these are all matrices. So we can actually add the pixels of 
one picture to the pixels of another picture and we get another table with corresponding um, values have been just added and we can just show this. So now what, what I'm getting is actually kind of a double exposure, um, a picture um, where I've just, you know, just added the pixels of two um, photos together and it's even getting uh, brighter because the colors are adding up so, so we could kind of um, do something else. So now we've got this table and we can, we can average it by uh, dividing it by two. Um, so it's a table and we're applying a monadic function. And now we're getting this ghost picture um, of me with both hands raised where I needed one to actually take the picture. And so, so this lets us actually do some interesting things. Um, for example, there is another way to get a picture, which is I can get a video snap I can that now. Um, and um, I can add it to the current costume. And I can do this all the time and average it. Now look what happens. I'm getting a motion blur effect on my live video. So here's kind of Alonzo, drunk Alonzo and Jens a motion blur effect, kind of a, um, uh, let me try to capture it. Um, so this is a motion blur effect on live video. Um, and, okay, let's try one more thing. Switching again to the costume of the camera. And um, so here's the pixels of the camera. And you know, it's a table, but a table really is just a list of lists. So it really is a list. So remember, we just did the reverse block using hyperblocks. Um, if it's just a list, it should work on the pixels also. So what if I just switch to the reverse camera picture? Oh, I got an effect I'm turning upside down because now the pixels are all in different order. So I could actually use this for another little experiment, making a variable called pixels. Um, so I'm setting the pixels to whatever the camera gives me. Um, and then I'm just switching to the costume where I'm adding the pixels to the reverse pixels. Um, you know, let's, let's try this. Um, so wow, look at this. Um, I got myself a kaleidoscope where I'm mixing um, my current view actually of the camera um, with um, a rotated version of, of, of myself. And I'm, I'm again getting these double exposure effects. Um, and this is all just, just with a couple of blocks. So maybe it would be interesting to actually also try to average this and I can do this while it's running. So now kind of the quality is a little better. I can do fun things like I can try to actually, let me try to align my eyes. Um, okay, so now I look like the abominable um, monkey man. Um, this is kind of our idea. The building blocks of media are uniformly represented in SNAP. It's as it should be in a digital environment, it's numbers. So we have numbers and lists of numbers and tables are lists and lists of numbers and we can just do arithmetic with them. We can just do math with them, um, to remix them, to manipulate them. But we can also do one more thing. We can make our own media and I'm gonna show you one way, you don't have to use this way, but another way that kind of doesn't use loops um, to actually create things. So remember the numbers from two block. So what if um, I get the numbers from one to a um, hundred thousand. 
random things. So I can map the numbers over the random function. And I want to get samples. So it's from minus 1 to 0.999. So I'm getting all the numbers in between. So now I'm getting 100,000 random numbers. Um, there's no loop involved here. Map does it all. And I can play this. And since it's random numbers, you know, you know what it's, it's noise. It's noise. So maybe I don't need 100,000. Maybe I just need 200. So now listen. There's just a little click. It's random. It's just a little click. So what if I repeat this random noise a couple of times, like 300 times? Um, so I want to use, I want to again use map. But I can't put this in here because otherwise I wouldn't be repeating the same noise over, I'm creating new noise. So if I want to retain the same noise, I can use call. I'm going to call this function with the input of the noise once. And so the list that's passed in should be the list that's also answered. I need to retain the ring here. So now what I'm getting is a table. I'm getting three, a list of 300 items of the same list. That is kind of random samples. So now what I want to do is I want to concatenate them all, flatten them into one big list. This is a new block in SNAP6, the append block. You can use it on several lists to concatenate them. Um, and now I'm getting this one big list. And here's really the kicker. So this is all, you know, just some random numbers repeated. And listen to this. Um, you might again want to tune down your sound a little bit. It's a sound. It kind of looks like, sounds like a buzzer, but a complex sound, even though there is no sine wave involved and none of the things that we learned. It's really just repeating random things. And so this governs the length of our seed. So if instead of 200, I'm just using 100, I'm getting an octave higher. If I'm again having it, I'm getting another octave higher. If I'm doubling the original one, I'm getting an octave lower. So you can actually um, kind of do this to start our own venture into um, making music into generating our own sounds. Now we've built this complicated function. Um, can we use it to do something else? What if instead of random numbers, we get a list here? A list of four items. The last item is 255. So now we're getting a table and this looks pretty much like a picture. So what if we interpret this actually as a picture? So I'm making a new costume, putting in this table, and I'm seeing the width here is 256, and the height is 300. Um, and we'll look at that picture, switch to that costume. Um, so I just computed myself a new picture. It's a gradient. to white because that's what these numbers do. So we can also slightly manipulate this and say, for example, 255, we're just inverting one channel and we get a color gradient from green to magenta. We can put in a zero here. Um, we get green to red. We can place this someplace else and get different um, computed gradients and pictures. So the idea is that we can analyze media, we can, we can do math, math with it, we can also change the context and um, create media ourselves. And this is kind of the vision, one of, one of the vision, visions that we're trying to accomplish um, with Hyperblocks. Um, now, another vision um, that is especially one that Brian is after is, you know, actually uh, utilize the whole power of APL. So the new version comes with this library that Brian has worked on that has all the primitives of APL 
And Brian's gonna do a session on this, so come to his session also. Um, so this is about really kind of reality, right? Um, and one thing that's been bugging me is, and this has been a recurring theme really, the reality, the feel of reality of what we're doing with Snap about the blocks. And we're gonna try something new right in the session. Um, I'm gonna switch here to the GitHub repository, uh, go to Snap, and this is kind of a world, <laughs> world new thing, here's releases. The current release is version 6.0, and we're 107 commits farther. So we're just gonna make a new release right now. It's gonna be version 6.1.0. Um, and it's gonna have um, this description with it. Let's check it. Okay, looks legitimate. I'm gonna publish this release right now. And there it is. And now I'm gonna ask Michael to deploy it right now to the Berkeley servers so I can show you one more thing. Michael, can you hear me? <laughs> Uh, it is, we're working on it right now. Let's see. All right, so we should be able to refresh and it should be good. I'm going to and refresh. See if the law of demos complies with us. Um, I'm gonna click and snap and see what's happening. And it is the new version we've just released. Okay, let me again, um, open my slides. Um, so there's just one new feature, and this has been a feature that, um, you know, back um, when I was working with Alan, Alan always said we should do this, and, and I, I did this for GP, and then somebody in the forums uh, by the name of Low Clouds, I don't know if you're here, um, uh, suggested that we add it to Snap, and user Low Clouds in the forums also had another great idea, um, so here's one more feature. It is fade blocks. It's somewhat experimental. So when we fade blocks, um, is we, I'm just gonna open this also. Here's the animate um, feature. When we fade blocks, um, we can um, make the blocks less apparent. They get more transparent. The thing gets darker and they're not in your face anymore. And at some point, and this was actually Low Cloud's idea, we're switching to the color of the blocks. And we can go all the way to the right until the blocks are all gone and just the text is there. And the idea really isn't so much to transition to text, but to take the burden, the visual burden of the blocks away. Um, as you mouse over it, you can still see the blocks um, and kind of focus more on the narrative. I personally like it to be just kind of subtle like this. And to me, this looks kind of more like um, a, a programming language that adults could work on. And I'm hoping that people might be more happy um, with a less um, childish way of programming. And, you know, there's, there's actually some, some problem in there because one of the aims of SNAP is to be non-intimidating, to, to kind of have this message that this is actually child's play. Um, but you know, um, this is something that we're trying to do. So another thing that this corresponds with is, uh, let's make a new project, is that remember we also have um, keyboard entry. So I can type in, um, so as I'm typing in, um, this also works kind of with the text mode. Um, um, so I can, I can do this um, and I can just, just type in. Then as I start typing it, the blocks are shown to me. Um, and um, I can type in the script, but just, I'm just saying TU. And I can type in A, A and I wanna change um, 
uh, a by one. So this is all typing. Um, and this is one way to maybe feel better um, and to have an individual way to um, uh, use SNAP in a way that looks more like your traditional programming language. Oh, folks, this was my demo. This was my talk. Um, did I make it in time? Uh, time for some questions. <laughs> You did great. We've got about 13 minutes. I'm happy to handle any questions. I didn't see any that queued up in the, uh, in the Q&A chat that were directly needing your answer, but I'm happy to, would you like people to just unmute themselves or raise their hand? It's up to you. Uh, yeah. Is, yeah. Show. Should I, just, I, I think I've, I just stopped sharing, right? That's probably best. Outstanding. Um, Folks, let's, uh, before, we, before we handle questions, let's give Jens a hand. That was outstanding. Yeah, Thank you so <laughs> much. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Feel free to unmute if you'd like or raise your hand. I can handle any of those things. I don't see any hands up. Just I'll try to manage this. I think there was some comment about people having to rewrite their curriculum. <laughs> Thank you very much, by the way, on the, <laughs> for the point of view of all of us who have curriculum. <laughs> That's outstanding. Um, I see a question from Ken. Uh, when you choose a type of, of input, should one still choose number when it can also be a list? That depends, Ken. So um, it's actually not yet a pervasive principle. We've just um, introduced hyperblocks to those blocks that otherwise would throw an error or, or give back something that you wouldn't want, like not a number. There are um, some functions, especially those that rely on testing equality that we haven't yet hyperized. By the way, the name hyperblocks, that's something that's coming from Bernat. Bernat uh, told us uh, and found out that this was what they use in, in Perl 6. Uh, that was very helpful. Um, so there are some functions um, like when you, like the equals um, uh, predicate or the index of predicate where we're testing for equality as we're also testing for structural equality. Um, we're not using hyperbox because that would change the semantics. Um, so if you're, um, using a block, um, if you're making your own block, um, I guess it's up to you to decide should it also work. Uh, are you using the primitives that all hyperize? Then your custom block will just automatically hyperize. We have a question from Philip who asks, can we get a summary of what you did with the sound blocks and look blocks and a shared tutorial file? Um, so there is actually uh, going to be a course that Yatka and I have worked on uh, for the past months. It's called From Media Computation to Data Science, and it's an open SAP. It's free for everybody. Uh, feel free to sign up. It's starting in September. Um, it's got a little part of um, what I've just shown. Um, and actually, most of what I've just shown you happened last night as I couldn't sleep and was so terribly excited about today that I just started Googling around and I found this Pink Floyd song and kind of did this stuff. And so, um, so I'm, it was gonna take me a while to write it up. Um, That's great. Uh, I think Yadu was, was mentioning that there's gonna be a media computation course that you guys are working on. Do you wanna talk about that for a second? Yeah, that's the media computation course I just mentioned. It's gonna be a four week course starting in September. Uh, had I known, had we known that four weeks is so much work, uh, I think we did a two week course. Um, but we wanted to try this, this kind of new thing that we, we've been really working on for the past kind of two years really, where we um, kind of go beyond introductory computing. Um, because kind of we feel like we, we've done kind of this introductory computing, get people excited about doing things. And we want to take the next step uh, because there's so much interesting things were bursting to show you. And so this is really our love for media computation uh, was something that we tried to have the proof of the pudding by t saying, you know, this is exactly the same thing, the same ideas that we need to analyze data to do some interesting analysis. Um, so this is what the course is about. Um, all the materials in the course are Creative Commons. Everything is... Um, 
free to make and, and to use. Um, so um, even if you don't take the whole course of your teacher, uh, just go ahead and take what you need and uh, you'll find some, uh, it's, it's 20 fun games, 20 fun activities, the kind of that I've shown you just here. Uh, I have a question I'll just add myself. I'm, I'm looking, I, feel free to continue to ask questions in the chat. Um, are there other features of 6.1 you want to mention? I saw that you pasted in about 30 things, 30 bullet lines. Are other things we should look for in 6.1? Uh, well, no, 6.1 6 is basically uh, a bug fixes. Um, uh, and uh, it's, it's really just this one thing. And, and it turned out to be bigger than I thought. I thought, uh, I think I mentioned the forum. I thought like I could do this with it. I just one line of code turned out I couldn't. Um, <laughs> so I keep kind of totally failing uh, the estimate of what it takes to build something. Um, uh, so um, no, this is the one, the one new feature. Um, there's another important feature for anybody of you who's working on forks of Snap. I've uh, added a little documentation how you can um, migrate your forks like Beetlebox, Turtle Stitch, um, to the new Morphic version that's way more stable and way faster. Um, very useful. Looking for any, feel free, folks. Other 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 thoughts. I've I have one more that was in the back of my head. One of the things I love about Snap Six, at least, is that it's almost real time. That the frame rates are approaching four, five, six, almost ten frames a second. If you're just you know just taking a screenshot and then displaying it, and then without doing any computation on it, what do you think you're up to? Is it about five or ten frames a second? It's really very quick. I mean, when you were doing your you know, the two eyes and the thing, it was very fast, much faster than I've ever seen in Snap Five. So, what do you think you're up to? Uh, I don't know. It depends, I guess, how big your picture is and how much computation you're doing. Because remember, every block you stack inside means one more iteration over the whole list. Right. Now, the reason we can do this fast is because it's not a replacement for a high order function. It's not a replacement for map. It's only a, repl a replacement for certain uses of high order function, where, you know, if you're using plus three on every item in a list, we know that this function will terminate. We don't have to do all this overhead to let the user click on the red stop button to stop it, like if, if there is no base case in some recursion or if there's an infinite loop, because we know it can't happen, which is why we can do it very fast at the low level. And that's kind of the beauty of hyperblocks. We felt that, you know, we're gonna do this thing, it's gotta be fast. Because it's one thing to always kind of boast with how aggressive it is. And then people come and code it up in some imperative way and say, well, but that's way more faster. So we thought if we're going to do this one level of abstraction, it better be really fast. And I'm kind of glad that it actually turned out this way. It's now faster to do it with hyperblocks um, than to do it um, iteratively. Wonderful. I'm looking for other thoughts. People uh, are th I'm, yeah, I've got a question. Go so ahead, Ken. Yeah. Um, given what you just said, it, I'm wondering if there's a coming in the future, uh, something would take advantage of the GPU when you're actually doing lots of linear algebra, you could speed it up several times and it's right there in the browser. Um, yeah, um, that's a uh, mid to long-term vision. So the current kind of redesign was really to, um, to what we had right now kind of technically was we pre-rendered everything and that took up a lot of memory. So it was faster to just redraw it when we need it just in time than to pre-render and cache it. Now the idea to really be faster is to make um, use of the GPU and to make use of multi-cores. Um, and that is something that, you know, since we're building on top of JavaScript, it's just slowly happening. At the at the browser level, uh, something called web workers and web something workers, called right. um, off-screen canvases. And uh, once we um, get to actually play with that, um, the idea would be to have actual um, concurrency. You know, to to have to have real kind of um, threads, um, hardware threads, actually. Yeah, in the future, uh, it's something we're looking closely at. But uh, don't hold your breath. I mean, maybe. Mm -hmm when it happens in, in uh, widely in JavaScript, we'll be able to use it, of course. 
And do stay tuned for the last session on Sunday where we're going to be talking about the future of SNAP. There's a future of SNAP panel. I just want to put a plug in for that. So a lot of these questions might be, what do you want to, you know, what's, what's, what's next? What's next? I think that'll be a whole session where the folks will do that. And that was one of the highlights for me of last year's SNAPCon. Wonderful. Other questions? We're doing great. We're about three minutes left. What a wonderful session this was. I, people were thanking you for the documentation on migrating extensions. So that was a big one. Big thumbs up there. I can see Bernard nodding and other folks nodding for that. We really appreciate that. That's, that's, that's something that we've needed. Thank you again for that. Let's see. I'm looking for... Oh, hyperized inline if. Uh, Michael, Michael, Michael is being snarky and asking for that. No, it's an excellent question. It's actually a funny question uh, because it's kind of the, the thing that um, uh, comes to mind. Like, of course, it should work. Um, and the, the funny thing is I actually spent a, a weekend um, writing it up and it did work, but not in the way I uh, like it did something and I felt like it was doing something wrong. And then I looked at it and said, oh, well, it's actually doing the right thing, except I had misconceptions about it. Um, so um, uh, our thought was that, um, you know, we could use, for example, a recursive um, declaration, a, a recursive definition for, you know, factorial and just use it on a list of numbers and get back a list of factorials. Instead, what we got was this really complicated nested list of lists of lists. And um, so if you look at it, it's actually right. Um, so um, it's probably something um, that um, if there are control structures involved, um, that we might think about having extra blocks, that it might just not be the right thing to overload the existing ones uh, if they're either testing for equality or if they're control structures. Um. All right. 